In the cathedrals of the ancient world, it is not just the face that tells the story of our ancestors, it is the architecture within the skull. These forgotten cavities and passages, the foramen, magnum, sinuses, and inner ear canals, whisper a history of climate, locomotion, sensory perception, and perhaps even the boundary between extinction and survival. Indeed, he foramen magnum, sinuses, and inner ear canals are more than anatomical trivia. They are the quiet gears of human evolution, each tuned to a different environment, each speaking of a different path not taken. In comparing the Neanderthals with mysterious figures like Kabwe, Petrolona, Dragon Man, and Jebel Irhud, we find more than anatomical variation. We uncover competing visions of what it meant to be human, from the age of Boole and Keith to the frontiers of modern genetics. The foramen magnum, the large hole at the base of the skull, is a crucial feature in understanding posture, locomotion, and brain orientation. Its position determines how the head balances on the spinal column, an anatomical compass pointing toward either the past or the future. In La Chapelle au Saint, the foramen magnum is notably oval-shaped, rear-placed, and angled. When French paleontologist Marcelin Boulle reconstructed this famous Neanderthal in the early 20th century, he imagined a stooped, brutish figure, part ape, part man. Boulle interpreted the low foramen magnum as a sign of an inferior gait, possibly a creature that had not fully embraced upright posture. Though this image was later revised, his conclusions influenced decades of thinking. In contrast, modern interpretations see the rearward foramen magnum not as primitive, but as adaptive. Neanderthals had large faces, long crania, and powerful necks. A rear-positioned foramen magnum helped balance the forward-projecting face and robust musculature. It was a solution to a specific biomechanical need, not a mark of primitiveness. Jebel Irhud, a Moroccan specimen dated to 300,000 years ago, shows a more centralized and round foramen magnum. Modern humans maintain this configuration today. It supports a vertical posture, upright head, and agile locomotion. The forward shift is not just anatomical, it's behavioural. It represents a commitment to a fully upright, mobile, and long-distance adapted lifestyle. Arthur Keith, an early London anatomist and proponent of the Neanderthal as human school, argued that the placement of the foramen magnum in Neanderthals and moderns was not radically different. While Boole saw degeneration, Keith saw adaptation and continuity. In light of modern scans, Keith was closer to the mark. The Cabwe skull, with its steeply angled and posterior foramen magnum, seems to retain more primitive traits. Its posture was likely more stooped and gorilla-like, with heavier reliance on shoulder and neck musculature for balance, features reminiscent of Homo erectus. The Petrolona skull from Greece, a debated specimen, shows a similarly rearward placement, with many features between Neanderthal and Homo heidelbergensis. These placements raise a theoretical possibility that some lineages were not heading toward Homo sapiens at all, but evolving in parallel for their own ecological niches. Homo longi, or dragon man, displays a very robust cranial base and an inferred rearward foramen magnum. If this skull belongs to a Denisovan or a Denisovan-related species, its morphology may reflect cold climate adaptation perhaps suggesting a broader trend where multiple archaic humans independently evolved rearward placements for craniospinal balance in extreme environments. The bony labyrinth of the inner ear includes the semicircular canals, which help us balance and coordinate movement. Their shape tells us how quickly a hominin could adjust to motion, balance during walking, or stabilize vision during hunting. Neanderthals, particularly La Ferrasi and La Chapelle, had short, wide semicircular canals, a configuration indicating a focus on stability over agility. Their bodies were short, powerful, and adapted for rugged terrain, not for sprinting or leaping. Their vestibular system prioritized sure-footedness, perhaps carrying heavy carcasses or navigating icy slopes. A study in Nature Neuroscience argued that Neanderthal inner ears had reduced angular sensitivity, which may have contributed to slower reaction speeds or diminished head-turn responsiveness. While this didn't make them less intelligent, 
it painted a picture of a more deliberate, less reflexive creature. Modern humans, and early fossils like Kafse 11 and Jebel Irhud, show a more elongated and narrow labyrinth, adapted for speed, head rotation, and rapid body repositioning. This vestibular setup is consistent with higher endurance, projectile hunting, and enhanced visual tracking, key traits of hyper-efficiency as described by Ludovic Slimak. This agility extends to cognition. Complex navigation, group coordination, and planning are facilitated by quick sensory feedback. Some theorists link vestibular precision to early symbolic behavior and even language evolution due to connections between balance, motion, and brain development. The Amud Neanderthal, unusually tall and large-brained, may represent a blend of Neanderthal stability and Homo sapiens-like agility. Some researchers suggest his vestibular system was slightly more advanced than that of his European cousins. This may reflect hybridization or adaptation to the Levant's varied terrain. Arthur Keith, who dissected skulls across Eurasia and Africa, speculated that vestibular traits were among the last to modernize and often preserved deeper ancestral patterns. He would likely have found Amud a fascinating example of evolution in flux. Among the most intriguing revelations in paleoanthropology are the discoveries of Asian archaic human skulls that exhibit Neanderthal-like inner ear structures, despite lacking other hallmark Neanderthal traits. One striking example comes from the Shujiao 15 specimen from northern China, dated to roughly 100,000 years ago. Although its external morphology is more generalized and lacks the mid-facial projection or brow-ridge patterns typical of classic Neanderthals, CAT scans revealed that the bony labyrinth, the inner ears, semicircular canals, and cochlea, were strikingly similar to those of European Neanderthals. This suggests either gene flow from Western Eurasian populations into East Asia or convergent evolution of balance and motion systems in similar environments. What's particularly significant is that the inner ear region is highly conserved in evolution, meaning it changes very slowly, so the presence of these traits hints at a deeper or more prolonged connection between archaic Asian and Neanderthal populations than previously assumed. Another compelling case is the Zhuchang Crania from central China, dated to around 105,000 to 125,000 years ago. These fossils combine a mosaic of archaic features low cranial vaults, thick bones, and massive occipital regions. Yet they also contain subtle traits in the cranial base and temporal bone that point toward Neanderthal affinities in the inner ear. Some researchers suggest this may be evidence of interbreeding events between Neanderthals and an archaic East Asian population, possibly related to Denisovans, producing hybrids whose vestibular systems adapted for rugged terrain, similar to Neanderthals in Ice Age Europe. These findings have reshaped how scientists view human evolution in Asia, challenging the outdated notion that Neanderthals were strictly a European phenomenon. Instead, they suggest a network of populations across Eurasia where Neanderthal-like anatomy, including the inner ear labyrinth, was more widely distributed and functionally significant than previously thought. So far, Dragon Man's inner ear hasn't been reconstructed, but extrapolations from cranial base shape and brain case dimensions suggest a robust, stable vestibular system. If Denisovans were mountaineers of the Pleistocene, their balance system may have been more fine-tuned than Neanderthals, but less agile than sapiens, a blend suited for highland foraging, perhaps climbing and traversing steep terrain. Neanderthals were built for cold, stability and power. Their unique foramen magnum, broad sinuses and thick inner ear labyrinth are a symphony of adaptation to Ice Age life. Sinuses are often thought of as annoying spaces that get congested during a cold but they serve profound evolutionary roles, warming air, reducing skull weight, and helping vocal resonance. Their size and shape reflect climatic pressures, breathing mechanics, and genetic legacy. Neanderthals, such as La Chapelle and Forbes Quarry, possessed large, voluminous maxillary sinuses, deeply recessed behind their massive cheekbones. These were not merely scaled-up versions of modern sinuses. They were differently shaped, tall and capacious. For a long time, these sinuses were interpreted by critics like Boole as pathological or poorly adapted, again part of the brutish stereotype. 
but recent studies using CAT scans and biomechanical modeling show that Neanderthal sinuses were exceptionally efficient at warming and humidifying cold, dry air. Their broad nasal aperture also helped with quick oxygen intake during strenuous physical activity, like sprinting after Ice Age megafauna. This supports a view of Neanderthals not as cold victims, but as climate specialists, exquisitely adapted to Ice Age Europe. Jebel Irhud, with a flat face and modest sinus system, suggests a warmer, drier habitat. Early Homo sapiens evolved in fluctuating African climates, where extreme cold was rare. Their sinuses were streamlined, no need for bulky warming chambers. In modern humans, sinus shape is plastic but generally more conservative than in Neanderthals. Our narrower nose and smaller sinuses speak to a generalist strategy, adaptable across many environments, but not optimized for any single extreme. Arthur Keith, analyzing various skulls from Africa and Eurasia, often emphasized the functional value of nasal breadth and sinus volume. He noted that sinus traits, far from being racial markers, were tools of climate survival. Kabwe has moderately large sinuses and a very wide nasal aperture, perfect for hot, dusty climates. Its air passages suggest a need for efficient filtration and moisture retention in an arid African setting. Petrolona, on the other hand, straddles two worlds. Its face resembles both Neanderthals and earlier humans, and its sinus morphology suggests adaptability to cooler southern European climates, though not as extreme as glacial France. These fossils represent the idea, promoted even in Keith's day, that human traits are not strictly linear, but climatically flexible. Although internal sinus scans of Dragon Man are limited, the enormous face and thick, zygomatic bones suggest large sinus chambers. If Denisovans lived in cold, high-altitude regions like Tibet, as indicated by the Xiahi mandible, they too may have developed Neanderthal-like sinus adaptations. Denisovans may represent convergent evolution, different lineage, similar solution. Homo sapiens with a centered skull, agile balance organs and slim sinuses represent flexibility and endurance, a body made not just to survive but to explore. Fossils like Kabwe, Petrolona and Dragon Man sit at the crossroads, challenging our need for tidy categories. They tell us evolution wasn't clean or linear. It was diverse, experimental, and often local. Early scientists like Marcelin Boulle and Arthur Keith built the frameworks we've since revised. Boulle saw Neanderthals as clumsy relics. Keith, more generously, saw them as human in a different key. Today, their competing visions still echo in our interpretations. Boulle's caution and Keith's curiosity both serve as reminders. Ancient bones hold truth but it takes generations to hear them clearly. Now, so the next time you breathe cold air through your nose, balance on a narrow step or hold your head high, remember you are shaped by these ancient conflicts and convergences. You are in part a Neanderthal, a Denisovan, a survivor of all their strengths, 